Good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all of you, our global audience. I hope you're keeping well and staying safe. A very warm welcome to Blockchain Ireland Week uh, to the Block W GMIT webinar on blockchain, data privacy and the future of local and global healthcare systems. My name is Joyce O'Connor, co-founder of Block W and chair of the Education Skills and Innovation Working Group in Blockchain Ireland. Block W is a women led network whose mission is to create awareness about blockchain and emerging technologies to increase equality and diversity in the application and use of blockchain and other frontier technologies. And blockchain or Block W fosters inclusivity by helping to provide pathways and access to educational skills around blockchain and other emerging technologies. We are absolutely delighted to be joined today by a distinguished panel of speakers, all entrepreneurs, innovators and global leaders in this area. Dr. Jane Thompson, Helen Disney, David Cospel and John Carmara. Our speakers will be introduced by Sorsha Mulligan, SME chain, and a member of the Block W Steering Committee. This is a very timely event. Global and local healthcare systems have been put to the ultimate test since COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And added to this is the cyber attacks on state services, both here in Ireland and worldwide. And this brings the issue of data privacy to the fore. So how secure is blockchain and can blockchain play a role in cybersecurity? Other questions will be raised. How is blockchain and impact innovators within the blockchain community stepped up to the challenge to design and build a more inclusive, data responsive and future proof system for our citizens at local and global levels? Our webinar today is hosted by our partners GMIT in the Innovation Hub, Thurlock Raftree Operations Managers at the Innovation Hub will give us an overview of work of the Innovation Hub. And thanks also to his colleague Michelle Lee for organising the production side of this webinar. Trevor, Dr. Trevor Clahasi, lecturer, researcher and author from GMIT will also join us. Trevor is a member of the Working Group on Education, Skills and Innovation and works in partnership with Block W. This year, we've great news. We have an inaugural Block W Summer Scholarship, which is funded by GMIT. And thanks to Dr. Rick Officer, Vice President of Research and Innovation in GMIT, and Dr. Orla Flynn, who is the President of GMIT. We're really looking forward to working with you, Trevor, and your colleagues on this project and the development of micro-credentials for students and for the community. Dr. Klosky will introduce us to GMIT and Thurlock Raftree will highlight the work of the Innovation Hub at GMIT. Then Sorsha Mulligan will introduce you to our distinguished panel of speakers. The floor is yours now, Trevor. Thanks a million for that, um, Professor Joyce O'Connor. Um, hello everyone, my name is Dr. Trevor Clausey and I'm a lecturer and researcher here in the Department of Enterprise and Technology in the Galway Mayo Institute of Technology. As Joyce says, said previously, um, we are delighted to partner with Block W and uh, for this event. Um, my own background in data privacy, I've been researching cloud for the last 10 years and as soon as people start move, moving critical infrastructure we're from their extant systems onto the cloud, issues regarding data privacy became to the furore. And in our rush to digitize, we often forget um, one of the most important things are the security aspects of systems, which can leave vulnerabilities open to cyber attackers. And as we've seen in the last uh, uh, week and a half here in Ireland, those vulnerabilities can not only lead organizations to ransom, but can lead a whole state. Um, also last year, myself and my colleagues, um, we researched a co the COVID-19 uh, tracing app and the idea of privacy and the impact on citizens in terms of their health data. While there's a lot of benefits to these apps, 
there's also some negatives and uh, it was interesting to see the perceptions of citizens why they were not using the app and the majority of the the, the, the causes of that was for privacy reasons so i'm delighted today to welcome the panelists i've had two of them on my podcast and which were really interesting insights uh, jane thompson and uh, helen and i'm really looking forward to the insights provided by the other two panelists today and on that note i'd like to uh, hand it over to turla craftery Garmagat, uh, Trevor, agus uh, fáilte uh, agus an dhéanaí siú agus um, uh, welcome to GMIT and the iHubs. Um, my name is Sherlock Rafferty. I'm the operations manager here in GMIT iHubs. I'm just going to give you a very short overview of the iHubs and the work that we do here uh, with our colleagues in GMIT. So Michelle, maybe if you could um, put up the presentation, please. So the iHubs um, are situated on campus in Galway, and we also have a number of other campuses, and we have another iHub on, on our Mayo campus. And the picture in the, the previous slide was just of the, the, the Galway iHub. So essentially what we do is um, we're an incubator uh, for startup companies and for scale-ups. Uh, in Galway, we have um, a focus, a strategic focus on med tech, digital tech, and uh, blue tech or marine tech companies. So we offer a number of different types of supports and uh, you can see those on the slide. We offer um, funding supports, we give space. We also do a lot of mentoring. We do a lot of networking. We like such as these types of events. And also there's a number of different R&D supports that are available on the campus. And here in the actual IHOP in Galway, we have a, a medical imaging center as well, which is, um, is, is a, a benefit to all our med tech companies that are co-located in the actual center here in Galway because it means that they can test um, a lot of their medical devices within the building and we have a lot of state-of-the-art equipment um, within that facility that they can uh, utilize. So if you go to the next slide please Michelle. Um, two, we also have two um, um, entrepreneurship programs um, that we run out of the center here in Galway and Mayo uh, one of the programs is called New Frontiers, and this is the uh, Irish National Entrepreneurship Program. It runs across the entire country, and it's um, supported and sponsored by Enterprise Ireland. And the program is designed to encourage indigenous startups within Ireland. Uh, typically, these types of companies would have some type of an innovative or disruptive element to them. Um, they would be high growth companies, and they would have an export focus. And uh, we've had quite a number of successes in terms of the companies that have come through the doors here in the IHUB in Galway and Mayo. And that just kind of illustrates some of the uh, founders that would have come in. We also had another, have another program, which is for female entrepreneurs called the Empower Program. Maybe Michelle, if you could go to the next slide, please. And this program has been running since 2020. And we've had about maybe, I think, in excess of about, I'd say 80 women have gone through the program now. We're just on our second cycle. And um, the program, this program is, is broken down into two streams. We have um, the Empower Start, which is for females that want to, um, they might have a business idea and they want to come in and de-risk the business idea before they go out into the marketplace. And then we also have another um, Empower program called Empower Growth. And Empower Growth is for established female entrepreneurs that want to rapidly scale their business. And that program is running um, across the CUA. GMIT at the moment is going into um, a merger process with a number of institutes of technology along the Northwest Atlantic seaboard. So we have um, our, our sister um, institutes in Sligo and in Letterkenny IT. And the Empower program was one of the first programs that we decided as part of the CUA, Connacht University Alliance merger, um, to run this program across the CUA. So um, participants can access the program through Sligo IT and also through um, Letterkenny IT as well. So that program has been very successful as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to um, finish up and talk a little bit about the centre here in Galway. If you go to the next slide, please, Michelle. Uh, this is just basically kind of, a, I suppose, a synopsis of the, the different types of features and supports and also the resources that are here in the actual Galway iHub. But I suppose the best way to visualize this would be to maybe see a quick video. So I will now finish up with this with this quick, short and uh, 90 second video. And I, I hope you enjoy it and um, I hope you enjoy today's talk. And I'm really looking forward to listening to the inputs of all the panelists. So thank you for your time. Garmagat.
So as you can see from the video, we have a number of um, breakout spaces um, within each of the different floors, um, just dedicated office environments. Uh, some of these are MedTech R&D suites. Uh, we also have um, an entrepreneurship room called the eHub, and we have a number of co-working spaces as well. And we have a lot of this, I suppose, state-of-the-art technology. Here you can get an idea of the medical imaging center, and you can see some of the tech that's on display there. So again, thank you for your time, and I'll pass you back over to Joyce. I'll jump Thanks. in there. Thank you so much, Turlock. And you've already um, engaged one of our panelists, John Camaro, wants to discuss uh, meeting with you guys at the next opportunity he can come over to Ireland. So well done. And thanks so much to Thank Joyce you. and Trevor for the introduction. And welcome everybody um, to this session hosted by BlockW and GMIT on day three of Blockchain Ireland Week. I'm delighted to bring this collective of powerhouses together under one virtual screen. We've all collaborated directly or indirectly in the past year during lockdown, either at crossover events like the UN General Assembly 75, SDG 16.9, uh, digital identity, and we all contributed towards Jane's thought-provoking and action-stirring global thinkathon pa white paper last September focusing on a human-centered system of systems at its core. Uh, themes from within will arise throughout this session and we can share the paper published by FinTech TV in comments in our um, audience here today. Our conversation today spotlights data privacy in the future of healthcare systems locally and globally. And starting locally, as Trevor mentioned, we are all aware of the cyber, tech, a cyber attack that Ireland's entire healthcare system and department have been under since last Friday. And to add some context, I saw a tweet last night from Ronan Murphy, the CEO of Smart Tech 247 cybersecurity firm, who said, in the last eight days, our teams are dealing with nine separate ransomware attacks made up of five different variants in six different countries. This is full scale out of control. So just days after the attacks here in Ireland, um, we were receiving, citizens were receiving fraudulent calls from criminals purporting to be from the Irish Health Service executive and vulnerable people were asked to hand over bank account details. Our government last week said that this cyber attack could take weeks to correct and 10 million of public funds, all while we were recovering from the economic and health upheaval of COVID-19. In conversations with the panelists during the week and reading media and research articles, it is apparent that something is, tr is true in both viral attacks and virus pandemics, that the patterns were there for us to see. We had warnings, but we didn't do anything. What can we learn from this? What are our governments? Uh, what can our governments learn? How can our citizens drive policy change? And how is blockchain addressing this recurring single point of failure? The, the economic, monetary, political and healthcare systems are all intertwined in a system of systems in every country and region. And we're all impacted, particularly when borderless challenges like climate change and COVID remind us that we are in fact one system within our one planet. What can the economic profession that leads our monetary and political systems learn from the healthcare profession? Economics is more than 2,000 years behind medicine in honing the ethics of its profession. And Kate Rayworth writes in Donut Economics that the economics profession can start with a Hippocratic Oath tailored to economists. The Hippocratic Oath states, do no harm, prioritize the patient, treat the whole person, not just the symptom, obtain prior informed consent, call on the expertise of others when needed. And four principles Kate Rayworth suggests to be included in an economist's oath is act in service to humanity, to human prosperity in a flourishing web of life, recognizing all that it depends upon. Respect autonomy in the communities that you serve by ensuring their engagement and consent while remaining ever aware of the inequalities and differences that may lie within them. Be prudential in policy making, seeking to minimize the risk of harm, especially to the most vulnerable in the face of uncertainty, and work with humility by making transparent the assumptions and shortcomings in your models and by recognizing alternative economic pers perspect perspectives and tools. So this morning, we will hear from some of the world's most renowned healthcare and emerging technology change makers who across the world are challenging broken systems for the betterment of local and global citizens, you and I, human-centered systems.
Let's get to know our panelists, uh, their missions, their views and experience on both the cyber attack and pandemic warning signs and how each of them are addressing these system fit vulnerabilities through blockchain. John, greetings from Dubai. Let's start with you. And of course, please don't forget to let our audience know that you have an Irish connection, which we all want to hear about. Um, thanks very much. Hi, Sasha. Uh, welcome. I'm really excited to be here. First of all, um, grew up in Ireland, in Dublin, for the better part of life. So I'm more Irish than anything else. I'm hoping to come back home in the next week or so. Um, 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 and uh, basically, uh, my my project over the past 12 to 24 months has been about democratizing healthcare creating the sovereign right of ownership of patient data, and then using all this information to then protect the patient by creating what we call import theory that allow the data to be stored on the blockchain and allowing the free flow and mobility of healthcare data. So even if a system is hacked, you can only hack one part. You can't have multiple parts of the patient. And also for hospitals as well, connecting them to the hospital, which is why we set up Afia Record. So uh, I run a company called Afia Record in Nairobi, Kenya, which is a healthcare, uh, patient driven healthcare platform that is built around the blockchain that allows for mobility of healthcare data, democratizing the value of healthcare data to healthcare practitioners connecting them to the patient outside of the hospital because we believe healthcare happens outside the hospital, treatment in the hospital, and then effectively create returning the sovereign right of ownership of that data back to the patient in real time so there is consistent duplication of information in, in case of something happened. Then on top of that, we also built what we call a privacy-driven uh, patient system that, are, that was solving the problem of COVID, where we're also able to track the disease without necessarily exposing the privacy of individuals, which we just got recognized by UNAIDS in regards to what we just did here in Kenya. And at the same time, I'm also the chairman of the African Blockchain Center, where we're also training blockchain developers to actually begin to create this solution. So thank you very much, Sasha. Fantastic. And congratulations on your recent award as well last week. Um, and uh, you're, you, you're fresh off stage in, in Dubai, so you've got lots going on at the moment. And we'll hear more as we go through the session. Um, then we're going to move on to Helen. Helen, welcome to the session from London this morning. Um, delighted to have you on again, addressing an Irish audience, as Trevor said, um, from the podcast. Um, so please introduce yourself and what's been happening with PCL Healthcare as well. Thanks, Sorcha. Well, it was great to be on Trevor's podcast, and it's also great to be on a panel with so much support for entrepreneurs in particular, and, and um, especially female entrepreneurs. We need more of that in the blockchain world because it's so important that this is for everybody, um, and there's so much talent to be harnessed. So I'm really happy to hear your announcements about the programs that you're supporting. Um, so my background is a mixture of healthcare policy and also being a kind of tech communicator and translator, if you like. So um, I got involved in blockchain about six, seven years ago. And one of the reasons I was so interested in it is I think that um, blockchain does have the power to solve some of these problems we're talking about around the fragmentation of health systems, around data privacy and security, um, and around really creating more patient-centered systems, which we don't really have at the moment. Our systems are kind of, first of all, designed to be sickness kind of based systems rather than wellness systems. Um, and they're also not really driven bottom up from the patient. They're driven top down by government policymakers for historical reasons. But I think the world is now moving on. So um, I do two main things at the moment. I run a platform called Unblocked, um, which proposes to do exactly that, unblock the topic of blockchain and how it can be applied in different areas. And we've we've run a, a regular healthcare event looking at the different applications and everything sort of starting from patient data right through to, um, you know, uh, the other end of the chain where you've got the kind of research side and, and the need for confidentiality of, of clinical trial data and so on. Um, and with PCL Health, um, I met them through my work with Unblocked and I now work with them on a regular basis. Uh, it's a healthcare startup, which is now scaling up since we, we fundraised at the beginning of the year. Um, and it's a connected care platform, which helps with remote monitoring. So obviously in COVID, we've seen how important it is to be able to keep people isolated for their own safety or for the safety of health professionals. 
Um, if we can actually monitor someone's health remotely, it saves money. It's better for the patient because they can stay in their own setting, in their own home. Um, it helps the families to stay in touch and, and other connected carers to stay in touch. Um, and what we want to do is to be able to make that interoperable so that we're not having to reinvent the wheel every time. So our platform can work with existing softwares within the NHS or with other healthcare system um, kind of processes so that we can just connect in. Um, and that way we can start to break up some of these silos and some of this fragmentation. And congratulations on the fundraise, which I've been following very closely. And I'm delighted for you and Deep D and the entire team um, because you were overfunded within 24 hours and, and the funds still continue to raise. So if anyone wants to hear about PCL Healthcare from Helen afterwards, I'm sure she won't mind you reaching out to her to get involved. Absolutely. Um, and yes. And we're actually about to um, have our apps go live in the App Store and Google Play Store so people can start to, to try that out as well in the next few days. Fantastic. That's brilliant, Helen. Thank you. And we'll get stuck more into what you've been doing with the NHS um, and indeed the progress that you've made on the ground in India. So we're covering all continents in the world here today from Africa to Asia. And now we're going to head over to Mexico City with David. Welcome, David. Thank you so much for getting up at a crazy time of 4 a.m. in the morning. I hope that espresso is hitting in and the energy is buzzing. Um, well, please yes. do int introduce yourself and what you've been doing with encryption. Sure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it's a pleasure to see some friends here who uh, uh, we've been on panels with in the past. So, hey, John, on the other side of the world, it's good to see you too. Um, so I I've been a bioethics um, um, professor for more than two decades now, um, teaching medical ethics. And also I've been a lawyer for a little more than that. Um, and um, my partner uh, is a genomic scientist, Dr. Vanessa Gonzalez. About 15 years ago, shortly after I met her and started learning about genomics, um, I wrote the book, uh, Who Owns You?, which was about the practice then of patenting genes. So um, it was a longstanding practice for about 15 years that uh, people's genes were being patented. Shortly after my book came out, there was a lawsuit about that. The uh, American Civil Liberties Union sued a company called Myriad um, to stop that practice, and uh, they won. The court went all the way up to the Supreme Court, or that case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, I got involved in some amicus briefs on that too. Um, but after after we won <laughs> and the genes were no longer patented, uh, there was a this gap, and that is the gap of ownership of the uh, genomic data. Um, in about that same time span, um, companies like 23andMe and Ancestry.com have been gathering lots of data. Um, mm -hmm. Turns out they have about 50 million people's um, genetic data, and the value proposition for that is significant. That's where most of the money uh, is made, actually, in selling genomic data. And so in 2017, uh, my partner and I uh, uh, started a company uh, to address this gap, to try to pro provide some way uh, for people to be remunerated properly for uh, their genomic data, which is valued highly uh, by pharmaceutical companies and other re researchers, um, and to give them control of that data. Uh, although you can't own uh, genetic data under any legal scheme, our platform, which we launched in 2018, um, the Gene Chain, allows people to be able to set a price for the data, um, add some self-reported medical data and demographic and behavioral data to make it more valuable for researchers, and, uh, and to receive payment for transactions using our uh, native cryptocurrency DNA. Uh, so our, our intention was to be able to open up um, what what her, you know, the economist um, uh, Hernando de Soto calls trapped capital. So there's tons of capital out there in uh, the poorest parts of the world. And, and your genetics, your genomic data, which is you know, most clearly your own, um, is we think a, 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 um, a store of a, tre a tremendous amount of wealth, um, both scientifically and economically. And by being able to access our platform through any web browser anywhere in the world, uh, as long as you can find somebody to test you and get your your data, uh, you can have access to that trapped capital. Um, we're actually we actually recently partnered with a company in Nairobi, um, Indigenous 
um, AI, which is also working with uh, John's company, um, Mafia Record. And um, we have a number of uh, exciting uh, new things we've been doing. We, we actually sold the first uh, DNA-based art as an NFT in April. That was my own genome. Uh, so that was kind of exciting. And, and we're, we're looking forward to uh, uh, expanding our, our um, footprint and providing the service we provide to researchers and uh, individuals uh, throughout the world. Fantastic, David. And we're going to get stuck more into the trapped capital element and what it can do to empower people all over the world in developing countries as well as developed um, to uh, work their way out of poverty um, or indeed to, to access new revenue streams in a way that they couldn't before. And this comes into not just financial inclusion, but infrastructure inclusion that we see so many people naturally excluded um, in, in today's uh, system of systems. And congrats on the, the DNA NFT, which dovetails nicely into our next speaker, Dr. Jane Thompson, which I'm sure needs no introduction. Um, uh, Jane has recently written a book, uh, Block Changing the World, um, and has written previous books in the past. Uh, Jane in Australia, Brisbane today, um, was on the uh, Married at First Sight uh, TV show, which has opened up an entire new youthful audience to blockchain and crypto assets, uh, including an NFT that Jane has just raised uh, to, uh, to raise funds for a charity. Um, but while you're not doing all of that, Jane, please introduce yourself and what you're doing in the healthcare space. Yeah, thank you very much. And I want to claim Ireland because <laughs> we came to Dublin on the 9th of March in 2020. It was in the middle of blockchain week and you cancelled St. Patrick's Day. And that was <laughs> when I realised that I had to go home to Australia before the borders shut. So we were there the day you cancelled St. Patrick's Day. We were planning some wonderful things with Ireland. But anyway, I've been locked down ever since. And so here I am in Australia. So um, I'm, I'm a kind of uh, blockchain evangelist for social impact at large, but only in Australia and trying to keep a global footprint going um, from being there. But David, I must talk to you later. We're writing a book on applied ethics in a digital age. So I'm sure we've got a lot of topics that um, we could share discussions on. I'm working with uh, a, a couple of DeFi startups. Um, I'm from a distance. Uh, remotely engage with John and the work he's doing. I think that that's amazing. Um, and uh, we're going to redo the paper that you so kindly talked about, Sorcha, um, from the Thinkathon. We, we're coming up, I haven't even told you that, we're going to come up with an event <laughs> and, and sort of do a, bring the band back together and do a rerun of that. But, but the big thing for me of recent times is watching what's going on with, with blockchain and frontier technologies in the pandemic and looking at some of the probably unexpected benefits that the pandemic has caused uh, in blockchain and technology. So I'll talk about that later. Fantastic. And uh, I, I love the collaboration across this uh, panel already. <laughs> GMIT Hubs has already got interest from John and David and Jane. You have a conversation to be had and I'm sure there's more uh, more to be had as well. But to our um, audience, great to see the numbers continuing to rise. Uh, please do put your questions into the chat box here. We're monitoring it. Um, if you've got immediate questions for the panel, we'll try to answer them during the session or we'll get to them towards the end. Um, but bearing in mind, this group have a lot to say and we have a half hour to go. So I'll, I'll try to get everybody in. Um, but I suppose to hear a little bit more about what's been going on in, um, in, in your healthcare space over the last year, um, and, and because there's an immediate collaboration existing between David and John, um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that, guys. So who would like to start? Maybe, David, if you um, want to, to, to talk a little bit about what you've been doing with John, and then, John, if you'd like to jump in just to, to add some commentary on the localised nature of, of what, uh, what the results are in Africa for this. So, David? Well, so... Our collaboration is with Indigenous AI, which is also a partner with Afia Record. Um, so uh, Indigenous AI is a genomic testing company that, start up, uh, that has started up in Nairobi. 
Um, they are founded by uh, some American founders who I'm, I've been uh, talking with and working with for the past couple of years, trying to find a way to work together. Um, and they are going to more or less serve as a CRO um, uh, in Africa. They've, they've got already uh, a um, cohort uh, lined up for testing and they're trying to build genomic testing capacity in Nairobi and then expand throughout Africa. So this is a real gap right now, the uh, testing capacity, um, but it's necessary uh, in order to get better insight into new diseases um, and into um, you know, uh, being able to provide uh, health, um, better health for people in Africa. We need to have better, better knowledge about genomic uh, you know, African genomics, and, and, and that's actually a huge gap throughout the world. So most genomic data comes from um, white Europeans. Um, it's, a, it's a huge problem for science uh, because in order to do the research, you need to have access to a broad range of uh, uh, gen genetics. Um, and uh, indigenous AI is trying to solve that now. AFI Record and, and indigenous AI are working together. I'm sure John can talk a little bit more about that. And John and I are working to be able to fill in the last uh, part of that triangle to solidify our relationship so that we can um, do all sorts of wonderful things together. And on the trapped right. capital side, yeah, will so, John get into that? Yeah, please go ahead. No, I think, uh, thanks, David. One of the things that we've, uh, we're trying to solve, first of all, is how do you democratize and create the sovereign right of ownership of health data. And I think that's where everything starts first. Even when you talk about genomics, when you want to do genome trials or sequencing, if patients don't have access to their health data, then all these things that we're talking about becomes a problem. And for us, that is where, when we look at the African continent and look at the fact that, you know, we don't have those stringent regulations that exist in Ireland, in the UK, in Europe, that allows mm -hmm. us to actually create the world's first, you know, real sovereign right platform that also takes, you know, the two sets of data, which is data coming from the hospital and the patient and merges it together and give the patient access to it and ownership to it, at the same time giving, you know, the health facilities a partition of the same type of information, which means, first of all, we save the cost of healthcare and we really, you know, challenge the system to say, you know, we already have, you know, really big problems in infrastructure and resources in Africa, which everybody's been trying to solve for years, but it's a very difficult problem because there are other structural issues but the data that we collect could be the game changer to helping alleviate the cost of healthcare because with data you do more efficient precision based things then when you then do look at genomics that means patients you know using david's platform can also then use that same data to generate wealth for themselves for the first time i actually can make money from my own health data and also i understand my genome and i can also track you know understand how i could fall sick or other types of diseases so when you look at where we first started a tracking disease platform was during ebola then COVID happened because we were already investigating how do you track Ebola? How do you track infectious diseases in a way that protects privacy, but also gives you real time information? So that's when we started thinking about how do you come up with a platform like this? We were already thinking about it, making patients anonymous, making individuals anonymous in the ecosystem, which is why people decided to use the platform. So, you know, for me, it's, it's a combination of everything, but the, the baseline is, if we don't democratize the way data is collected, who collected data, where the data is at, and who can access it and bring the patient into that same ecosystem by then providing precision-driven healthcare, cost-effective healthcare, and patient-driven healthcare, then everything else we're trying to achieve, which also means that when people even try to attack systems, you know, the platforms, it becomes very difficult. Because again, you're not doing things around interoperability. Sometimes we keep you a problem. We look at mobility. You know, the one consistent thing that I always say about healthcare, there's only one person who moves, is the patient. Mm -hmm. And all mm -hmm. of us, all of us are patients, irrespective of other hats that we wear. And that's part of the work that we're then doing with, uh, you know, genome at the end of the day. But the baseline, first of all, is how do we create the sovereign right of ownership of data back to the patient to reduce the cost of healthcare. And um, it's, it's, it's making sure that we understand the narrative 
as the individual is a patient and not a consumer in what we see in the pharmaceutical companies or um, in, in the uh, capital markets of healthcare. Uh, we are consumers rather than patients. So it's great to see that human centered system that you're building um, and the regulatory environment that hinders progress. I mean, we see that from your perspective in Africa and we're going to hear next from Helen on that and what she's seen in the UK in comparison to um, to, to India and the progress that's been made and actual tangible results that have been produced. Um, but one point, um, I'll, and I think it was David who mentioned it, was that um, the entire um, healthcare system and prognosis, et cetera, is built on uh, one demographic and it's white men. So it also excludes women. So our bodies are completely different to male, yet uh, medicine is scripted um, to, to exclude us. So we need to look at how we bring in uh, not just eth ethnic ethnicity but also gender into into the data database and I know that you guys are addressing that but Helen over to you please tell us what's been happening with uh, PCL healthcare um, in addition to the very successful fundraise but the results that you've seen on the ground in India um, with your device in comparison to say the slower progress getting through the regulatory system um, of the NHS in the UK. Well, it's really interesting to compare because I think in Western countries we have this false impression that we're so sophisticated and we're so advanced. You know, <laughs> our systems are so much better than in other places. Um, and obviously, you know, it's terrible to see what's happening in India with COVID at the moment. But you know, thinking about what John's already said, and and we had a recent podcast with PCL Health hosts a Healthy Aging podcast, and we had John's colleague, uh, Dr. Alex Kahana, who many people on this panel know. Mm -hmm talking about the project in Africa. And I think what's so interesting is how you can really leapfrog um, when you have a different setup uh, and you can start from scratch. So when um, the original pilots were done for PCL Health, which was, was then called Punya Care um, in India, we were able to you know, go and work with a remote monitoring device, just a very simple little kind of white box that has different um, abilities to take different vital measurements from patients. It's very simple, taking temperature, taking blood pressure, taking basic vital measurements. Um, and just doing that, we were able to pick up um, some quite serious problems from the people that took part in the pilot and identify things that needed to be to be dealt with and potentially save lives. Um, while over here in the UK, we've been in discussions with people um, for over a year about getting pilots started in the NHS. And if, you know, if we've been able to start a year ago, just think how many people we could have already helped. So, um, you know, it's it's nothing sort of against the NHS. It's a, it's a, a wonderful organization. And obviously we're incredibly grateful for the amazing work that's been done over the last year in COVID with everyone being so overwhelmed. But I think we need a more systematic vision when we think about all of these changes, because we've got so many different things happening at the same time. We've got this massive demographic shift, which creates a whole policy um, kind of dilemma and an agenda from a political point of view about how we actually fund and organise healthcare. We've got kind of standing on the cusp of all these technological changes. So we've got so many more tools in our arsenal. Um, we've got blockchain. We've got the ability to use AI to actually understand and segment this data and, and think about what it means and look at the trends um, that are happening so that we can help people stay well. Um, you know, and then we've got also people's own kind of behavioral change. So, you know, I think we're all starting to realize that, um, you know, platforms have extracted a lot of data from us. Um, and yeah. that they've made a lot of value from our data. And certainly you can be exploited, particularly if you're from a minority group or you're from a developing country. We've seen lots of examples um, uh, where we've had kind of, you know, very bad things happening um, in terms of people's genomic data being exploited and so on. Um, and so we're now much more aware that our data is really, really important. And, and we need to shift to that approach where it's about me staying well. It's about me being in control. I have the right to my own data from an ethical and moral point of view, how can, you know, technology and politics come together to help that happen, I think. And it's the, the policy writers that also need to get involved at this stage and be braver as well. And we see it um, even in, in, in Ireland that uh, policy makers are very interested and uh, progressive towards 
what we can do next and also the real cases that are are evident across the world that we should be able to adopt. So that's already happening here. Um, it's promising. It's going to take time. Um, but I'm sure we've got Jane on the ground. We've got John on the ground. Helen, you're just across the water. And David will be bringing you in as well. Um, so we, we have to see that in, international collaboration has to be fundamentally part of this. We can't just really silo off decision making in one uh, country, and uh, particularly as we're part of the European Union. And as part of the European Union, we're part of a much bigger picture. Um, so we, we need to be recognizing that system of systems and we are one within that. Um, yeah, I mean, just to add on to that, I, I saw Abdul was raising a question about blockchain itself and how it should be used. And so just to elaborate for people who may be listening in who don't necessarily know blockchain and know what it is. So with blockchain, I mean, there are many different types of blockchains, if you like, that exist out there now, um, starting from the original conception of, of the public blockchain that, that created Bitcoin. Um, but you have distributed ledgers, which essentially means you have a kind of a, a backbone where you can identify where data is stored if we're talking about healthcare. Um, so you're not storing people's data on a blockchain necessarily, but you can think about it as a kind of distributed database uh, where you can kind of point to things that you want to find. I think that's the, probably the simplest way of describing it. And because that um, information is distributed across lots of different places and lots of different organizations. It's not created centrally like a government top-down healthcare system might be created or a system within a hospital or a doctor's surgery which don't talk to each other. Um, it starts from the perspective of there's a network that you can join and you can then access your data and it's, it's a kind of an audit trail of all the things that have happened. Um, so when you think about that in regards to our, our our data, I think, again, to, to sort of cite what Alex Kahana was saying, you know, we are our data and our actions create our data. And so our data is us. Um, and so it, it really gives us an audit trail of us. That's the best way of describing it, I think. And I think that's really, um, for me, a good way of framing the whole thing. So we don't have the single point of failure that we're reliant on one hospital or one doctor surgery or one, you know, government system. We have our own secure access to our, our data, hopefully, in our own uh, wallet, if you want to call it that, on our phone. So an application where we can see our history and our activities and we can keep track and we can potentially also exchange any monetary value that needs to occur as part of a healthcare interaction. So suddenly, you know, these things are now combined, the, the action of the person, the data surrounding their healthcare, and then any financial transactions that might need to arise from that. Yeah, and what we have to bear in mind is the, the GDPR element of it as well, and, and where that fits in, and indeed in different parts of the world where it's relevant uh, today and not relevant. So that's a question that keeps arising again and again. Um, but then over to Jane um, and uh, delighted to hear that there will be a follow up to the Global Thinkathon where all of the views expressed here today will hopefully feature because um, there was it was a fantastic paper. And I do have a copy of it here, so I'll pop it into the um, into the chat so everybody can see it. Or if anyone wants to talk to Jane about it afterwards, um, please do reach out to her on social media. Um, but Jane, talk to us a little bit more about the guidance and the follow up from last year's paper um, and the, the actions that you saw uh, progress versus what you see as, as the biggest challenges for the healthcare system that will impact overall um, how, how we move into this, this next stage of, of, uh, of, of our future. Well, look, thank you very much. And, and we're certainly putting the band back together, but other people who are on this um, webinar who weren't in the original band, you're invited. So just let me know if you're happy to join us because it was uh, it was really, really stimulating and insightful. And I think we created something terrific from it. And I think if you read that paper, you know, a year on, it's still really quite relevant. And, and, you know, I do think that we can update it with some different things that we've discovered since. So, yeah, please join us. But I guess I wanted to touch on a few points. One was absolutely to emphasise what Helen and John have said, and, and David, you're in Brazil, about innovation in emerging markets. Because I believe that, that what we have been seeing during the pandemic and will continue to see 
is the locus of innovation moving from the West to the emerging markets? Because they've got 70% mobile coverage now, 90% of the world's young population who are all digitally, digitally literate. They've got massive problems to solve. They don't have legacy systems. And so as Helen said, they're going to be much quicker to kind of innovate and trial things that solve problems that they've got. And so I think we really need to you know, turn to emerging markets. Um, I did write a chapter in a book about this lately, if anyone wants it, happy to share, um, just looking at some of the evidence and some of the really interesting things that are happening there. But I also wanted to bring up the point that, I mean, we're all kind of obsessed, if you like, during the pandemic about our own situation, and that's normal. Um, India's probably bought into stark relief you know, how challenging it still is in many places. And obviously Brazil didn't um, go very well. But, but one of the points that I wanted to make is that it's estimated that probably a, a hundred million people will fall back into extreme poverty as a result of the pandemic. Um, and the most disadvantaged people as a result of the pandemic have been women because they're the first to lose their jobs. They're the first to need to go home and, and look after their families and, and so forth. And so we just need to, to think about this whole issue that people are saying as it being a pandemic of inequality. And as we look at both building back the economy, but also thinking about the healthcare system in the future, um, I think it's really important to think about the kinds of innovations um, that are going to be targeting and helping the poor and vulnerable. And I want to, it's not very healthcare and I kind of don't care because one of the things that, that I want, and healthcare people tend to just think about health. We need to think about the whole social determinants of health and the setting in which people are living. And there was a great video that came out about a week ago um, from Leah Callon Butler in the Philippines, where people are playing a game called Axie Infinity, which is a which is a game where people can um, buy and sell NFTs within the game, and Filipino families are earning money playing the game to keep their families alive during the pandemic. So there are new and different ways that we can work on poverty and inequality that no one imagined before and we're seeing that happening in the pandemic. We're seeing things like um, crypto remittances being used for foreign exchange because micro entrepreneurs that sell Netflix and Spotify cards can't get foreign exchange and so they all the cash shops are shut and so they've turned to using crypto. Um, and so just looking at uh, projects like the good dollar who anyone in the world can get onto and get good dollars every day and then start spending them in a marketplace. People are innovating and creating whole new ways to think about how we deal with poverty and inequality. In healthcare, we saw a tremendous amount of innovation in our own countries as we uh, scrambled to solve the problems of the pandemic, whether it was the secure data sharing or whether it was the tracking for good or bad of, of people for case finding, or it was like Helen's project, remote healthcare. If you'd have asked me two years ago whether health was right for disruption, I'd have said absolutely no, all the legacy curtains are down, it's impossible. The pandemic has lifted those curtains. So I'm, I'm going to stop because I know everyone's got something incredibly interesting to say, but what the pandemic's done for us is A, put a focus on healthcare, everyone is paying attention now and I can tell you that's a good thing. And secondly, it has resulted in acceleration of innovation and digital in healthcare on a whole lot of fronts, which we now need to leverage. And that's really important for all of us on this panel. Absolutely, and well said. And the redistribution of health and therefore wealth is at the core of this because people who currently cannot access um, the infrastructure that allows us to, um, to, to, to be remunerated, and that's through uh, John and David's initiative in the, that trapped capital, uh, we need to put the digital technology in the hands of those that need it most in order for them to empower themselves out of poverty and that gender divide um and the i was talking about it in the in the small medium enterprise space last year in in finance about the disappearing women of covid because in every panel event that we went to um throughout the summer um there was just one demographic of faces in every single event 
And I saw this not just in, in Ireland and in the UK, but it was everywhere. And then suddenly I realized it's not just in finance, it's in technology, it's in healthcare, um, it's in government. So just what you said there, Jane, is that women, um, and, and when I posed the question across social media or to my network, um, the, the answer was always, well, we're, we're taking care of the people that we have to, including ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a very valid point. And, and again, it has to be gender centric and not just um, building on, on what is, is, is currently okay. there. Um, and the good dollar, I've shared that uh, link into the, the uh, chat there, everybody, and indeed the Thinkathon white paper. So uh, please do follow up on that. And then I guess we've got about eight minutes left and we want to hear some questions from the audience. So please do get them. Uh, flowing. I know that um, Abdul, you've been asking about blockchain. Helen has has answered that. Uh, um, Paula and Jane, you need to have a conversation after this. I've already set that up, so expect a, an email from me. Um, but let's let's hear from each of you again on what do you think you, we need from our institutions to facilitate. Um, a global spread of the good work that you're doing. Because as we see um, with Encryption and with Afri, Afri Record and with PCL Healthcare in India, in Africa, in, um, in, in Mexico, um, that the, 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 the progress hasn't been made in the Western world because of the infrastructure we have in place. So um, John, back to you. Um, what do you think we need to do in the Western world and in Ireland, since you're on the ground here, in order for us to see the results that you're seeing in Africa? I think the first thing is the will of, of the you know, institutional bodies themselves to want to change because the, the, re the regulation, everything is written by constitution and individuals. I mean, we've seen the transformation of Ireland technology wise from the 90s. You know, when we first started living in Dublin to the city that it is today, because there was a will, the will to mm -hmm. change, the will to transform Ireland. And, and we're all reaping the benefits of that, you know, going through that process, walking in for force, you know, all these things that made it possible for Ireland to become a technology hub. So the same thing has to happen in healthcare. And it's Jane said correctly, the pandemic has, you know, put the spotlight on the fact that we do have to do those things. And you know, even in Ireland as we stand today, I, I don't have access to my health record except I go to the hospital. And that's not right. Or I go to the GP, you know, uh, where I used to live, but and that's still not right because I could be sick here in Africa and or I could be sick in London. I, and I have no access to that information, the basic thing, you know. So the power of that data, especially since we're part of the European Union and the, the joint network of that information means that, you know, you know, it also becomes very difficult for people to defraud you of your own data because you're now mm. participating in the access points of that information. So, and, and so it, it becomes, it also helped the government to even have solved this problem that they're having. If, you know, we had thought through how do we also democratize access to health data rather than, and one of the things that I read, I'm not a lawyer, but David can, you know, talk today is I, I, I started, started studying law a little bit just to understand and I realized that the biggest sort of to say fraud was being told that you don't have access to your health record for mm -hmm. so many years by doctors in hospitals, because it's mm -hmm. not true. The law says clearly, yeah. as long as I pay for it, yeah. it is my information. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. is the most beautiful thing that I've learned so far. As mm -hmm. long as I have paid for it or somehow participated in bringing that I own, and I deserve the right. Mm. So I think for government, for me from Ireland is will, and well, even in Africa as well, it's also the same will to want to adopt and to want to provide better health care for the citizens in a way that also helps the health practitioners provide better health care. And at the same time, creates a new level of wealth, even for the health practitioners as well. Yeah, and it's that, uh, I, I remember that now, as long as I pay for it, it is my information because we see the same in financial services and um, those data files were uh, mandatory and regulatory um, opened up to um, citizens who wanted on-demand information about what are you holding on me and the banks had to have to produce it within X number of days. Um, so I'm not sure if that exists in the healthcare system, but it absolutely certainly should. And um uh, you guys are the ones to be... It, it actually uh, exists, Sasha. If you yeah. think about it, if you write to your hospital, 
they'll send you yeah. the information every time. Yeah. Because all of us have been through it. Every time you write them, they'll they'll email you the information. So, mm -hmm. but it's just that they will never tell you upfront that you have a right to it. Yeah. Yeah. That transparency and the trust it goes back to. So everybody here, your your freedom of information, <laughs> you now know it. And that goes back to the Hippocratic Oath that we discussed at the very beginning. So great to see it tie in and that you've been learning the law because it just proves that those systems of systems, we can't just be learning in the profession that we're in. So I'm from a financial services background, but I've been learning about agriculture and food supply chains and value chains, <laughs> only now delving into the healthcare side um, and we need to we need to understand and interpret across all of these systems. Then, David, over to you and what you've learned um, from working in uh, South and Central America versus Africa, and and how we can use that um, for the for the rest of the world. So there there is a there's two areas that need to be clarified for um, us to be able to realize the great potential that we see in these sort of technologies and, and to liberate that capital for the, the most disadvantaged. And the first is uh, more clarity about the, the role and acceptability of crypto. Uh, so it took us a long time to make sure that DNA, the currency, was available uh, in, a, in the United States. We had to find a partner who was able to deal with it and there's all sorts of legal uncertainty still about the, the, the acceptability, general acceptability by the US of, of crypto and how, how that's gonna be managed. So that needs to be resolved worldwide. Um, there's all sorts of jurisdictions where, you know, uncertainty about um, um, crypto has caused a great deal of turmoil. Um, and another thing uh, that needs to be resolved, the second thing is, is the relationship of ourselves to our data. So as I mentioned earlier, you don't, you don't own data. There's no legal regime under which data is owned. Uh, the closest thing we get is intellectual property law. Um, but because, for instance, uh, your genome is not an expression that you create, uh, you have no claim to it under intellectual property law. Um, and there is no legal regime under which you can claim uh, ownership of that data. Uh, naturally occurring data, medical data, unless it's you know, put in some sort of new expression, uh, can't be owned like that. So we need clarity from states about uh, our relationship to our data. I think this needs to be an international movement uh, to make us the, you know, proprietors of our own data. Um, and to do so in a way that, that keeps it available and, and encourages the use of it in science. So those are two, two things we need to resolve. Um, in uh, the Global South, this is a, this is a real lacuna. Uh, or two, uh, uh, two gaps that exist actually. Um, and uh, it's keeping people from being able to uh, do things that would ben benefit their pocketbook, uh, pocketbooks and um, also their health. Uh, so I would like to see um, states that are in a better position to address it, um, get serious about resolving these, these gaps. Absolutely. And and part of it is the citizens as well, our relationship with our data and our money. Um, I'm conscious that Helen has to drop off at uh, half past. So, uh, Helen, if you want to say anything, your, your closing comments. Just very quickly, I mean, first of all, thanks to amazing panel. I would love being with all the people that are on this panel and been with them in various different events before and, and different projects. So um, great to be back in touch with everyone since we're all so far apart these days. Um, in terms of do no harm, I think, um, you know, the key thing for me is what are we missing? You know, what are we missing by not capturing this data? So think of how many people we could help. Think of how much you could help yourself if you knew more about yourself and knew more about your behaviour. We, we all think we know ourselves, but actually it's only when you start tracking your own health habits and your health behaviour, you really start to get insights into what you do and learn about your diet or your exercise or your sleep or your stress levels. Um, or your blood pressure, you know, and by, by learning more about yourself, you can really get to know and, and help yourself. And I think, you know, what we've seen in COVID is how much missing data we've had because we weren't set up at the beginning. You know, we lost so much information at the beginning, even if it was just, you know, that someone's temperature had gone up and they probably shouldn't have gone out to the shop. You know, we had mm -hmm. so much information that we we lost and that one person going out then has a ripple effect on so many other people who got infected. So, you know, we really kind of, missed the signals with this we knew a pandemic was coming and we didn't act and I think we just can't afford to do that again very well said we missed the signals and we referred to that at the beginning is that 
Now, let's not miss the next signals. The patterns have been repeated. So uh, then on to Jane for the Global global Thinkathon, and that will uh, lay out exactly the, the parameters and guidance for how not to miss these indicators again, I'm sure. Jane, what would you like to say for closing comments? Yeah, just a, just a few comments. But the first one is all of us in public health saw the signs and were shocked mm. that a global pandemic wasn't declared earlier. That's the first thing. But this is the first time in my lifetime that we've got the celebrity doctors. You know, no one took much interest in health professionals before, especially pub, uh, public health professionals. So we've had a wake up call and we actually need to figure out what we can learn from that. But the problem that I see is that our system of global governance that was set up post World War II has not served us well during the pandemic. And even some of our own governments have struggled to be able to guide the populations through the pandemic and make the right kinds of decisions. We've seen very, very varied performance in terms of government. We've seen other things happening at the same time, which, which relate to this whole issue about governance around um, CBDCs and digital currencies. We've got platform companies that have bigger economies than all the countries in the world except for China and the USA. They're not in the global governance system. Is there something wrong with the way we're thinking about things? And sort of back to the thinkathon, we've we've got an economic system that rewards profits to shareholders above everything. And what we've understood is that we need to look after people first. We need to look after the planet and we need to make sure that we've got an economic system that works for everyone. And so I think we need a very big rethink. The challenge, however, is that people who are currently in charge of our legacy systems, our governments and our international agencies probably don't understand that, probably don't have the vision to be able to make a, a change and probably will be protecting like mad their secure positions in those legacy systems. So how we actually unravel that and create a movement for people who want to see something different um, is a major challenge. And then my final point, because we're in blockchain week, is I think what we've seen is that the pandemic is a global commons problem and blockchain does offer some promise around dealing with the global, co uh, global commons with the distributed autonomous organisations. So it would be really great to see some people experiment with that and see what could be built using blockchain that might help us with some of this global commons government governance that our legacy systems really struggle to deal with. What a fantastic way to wrap up and summarize the entire conversation, Jane. And even better, the fact that there is a call to action for everybody here in the audience, self-included, to participate and um, get in touch with Jane. Um, and as she said, um, we will be included in, in the next Thinkathon series. So uh, we'll wrap up there because we're a few minutes over time. Thank you to our exceptional panel, um, <clears throat> Jane, Helen, John, David. Uh, it's been inspiring as always, learning from you and echoing what Helen said. It's great to see everybody again in a different setting and we will be seeing each other again. Um, Joyce, Trevor, Turlock, thank you so much for hosting us and to our fantastic audience and your excellent questions. Thank you so much and we'll be seeing you again soon. Thank you.